Okay, so this section is a bit of a hodgepodge, but I guess fundamentally it's combining the last two sections. I mean, in the sense that we have used the unit circle to define the cosine and the sine. And then we talked about, you know, finding the cosine or the sine of these sort of famous angles, pi over three, pi over four, pi over six. And then we said, well, we can do a little more than that using reference angles. We could find the sine or the cosine of five pi over six or, or seven pi over four or whatever. And then we have these other trig functions. Uh, the tangent, most famously, but the tangent, the secant, the cosecant. And these are defined in terms of the sine and the cosine. The textbook's a little weird. It says, well, these are sort of the fundamental identities. I wouldn't really call them identities. I'd call them definitions. But the tangent is the sine over the cosine. The secant is one divided by the cosine. The cosecant is one divided by the sine, and the cotangent is the cosine over the sine. So we make the observation that, well, we can combine the left and the right hand side of the board together. We should be able to find, for example, the secant of pi divided by six, because the secant of pi divided by six is one divided by the cosine of pi divided by six. And then that would be the square root of three over two. So two over the square root of three. And I've never cared deeply about rationalizing. No one's ever been able to explain to me why having square roots in enumerators is better than having square roots in denominators. But if you wanted to, you could then rationalize that. And likewise, you know, the material we did with reference angles, if you can use a reference angle to figure out the sine and the cosine, then you can figure out any of the other four trig functions. Um, we actually, maybe I should slow down a bit because actually what we actually got to wasn't all of the reference angle stuff. We made a statement about what happens to reference angles when they're in the second quadrant. So I guess before we start talking about um, 
the other trig functions, we should finish this up. But it's, it's going to be pretty similar to what we did yesterday. Say we have an angle that's in the third quadrant. Then the reference angle, assuming that we are using radians, is going to be theta minus pi. Or no harm in saying, if we're using degrees, it would be theta minus 180. And then the sine of an angle is going to be the negative sine of its reference angle, the cosine of an angle is going to be the negative cosine of the reference. What am I writing? I'm saying reference angle, but I'm not writing it. Uh, so this is similar to what we saw in the second quadrant. In the second quadrant, the signs were equal and the cosines were negative. Here, they're both negative. And again, this is because, I mean, the sine and the cosine are the x and the y coordinates. So this is just, in the first quadrant, everything is positive. In the second quadrant, the y coordinates are positive, but the x coordinates are negative. In the third quadrant, the x coordinates and the y coordinates are both negative. In the first quad, in the fourth quadrant, the y coordinates are negative but the X coordinates are positive. So we're just using that. I mean, okay, we're in the third quadrant. So our sine and our cosine must both be a negative. And I actually probably wouldn't bother memorizing the details about the negative signs. Like, oh, in this quadrant, the cosine's positive and the signs, I wouldn't really memorize that. I just think, okay, we're in the we're in the fourth quadrant, X is positive, Y is negative, and I get it that way. So if I wanted the sign of five pi over four. That's an angle in the third quadrant. The reference angle will be the angle minus pi um, to do the subtract yeah, to do the subtraction, we need a common denominator, pi over four. So the sine of pi over four is the square root of two over two, but we're in the third quadrant, this Y coordinate is negative, so we throw in a negative sign. Finally, if we 
have an angle that goes all the way into the fourth quadrant, then the reference angle is going to be two pi minus theta. Or if we happen to be using degrees, 360 degrees minus theta. So let's say, what would a good example be? And again, the sine and the cosine are going to be the sine and the cosine of the reference angle, except that maybe they're negative. Let's do both the cosine and the sine. So I don't know if it's immediately obvious, it will sort of depend on how comfortable you are with this. If it's immediately obvious that this is an angle in the fourth quadrant. Um, remember that if you go all the way around, that's two pi and two pi is 12 of pi over six. So I'm just thinking 11 pi over six, well, that's really close to two pi. So that's going to be in the fourth quadrant. It's, going to be something like that. So the reference angle will be this, getting a common denominator. So we can do the subtraction it's pi over six. So the cosine of pi over six is square root of three over two. The sine is one half. And then I'm just gonna pause a moment to think, should either of those be negative? If it's not something I've committed to memory, I'm just thinking, well, we're in this quadrant, our x coordinate is positive, but our y coordinate is negative. So the positive cosine is okay, but the sine has to be negative because the sine is a y coordinate. And then, as I started to say, once you're comfortable with this, if you wanted to know, well, let's keep the example from the last frame. If you wanted to know the tangent of 11 pi over six, it's the sine of 11 pi over six divided by the cosine of 11 pi over six. And then you just have to find these both, except that we've already found them, negative one half, positive square root of three over two, um, you can simplify this, this one half and this one half go away. Negative one over the square root of three. And then again, if you want to, 
you can rationalize and get the negative square root of three over three. And you don't, you should not memorize um, these values. You should just, if you need a tangent or a secant or whatever, you should, you, you should find it this way. You should not, I mean, there are four other trade functions. That would be 12 other uh, things to commit to memory, and they're not worth that. Then I said this was this chapter or this section was a slight hodgepodge. Next piece of material, at least on the surface of it, isn't really related to reference angles, but even and odd function. So did you know what an even function or an odd function is? Are those terms I'm seeing a kind of dubious expression that is absolutely fine? A function is called even if it has what we call y-axis symmetry. So if we draw the Cartesian plane, we'll think of the y-axis as being a mirror. And a function is even if it's its own reflection. A function is even if you take this part of the graph and you flip it over the y-axis and you get this part of the graph. Um, the reason these functions are called even is that the sort of classic example of an even function is y equals x raised to any even number. Like, y equals x squared is even. Making allowances for my rough artistry, but if you take the part of this graph on the right and you flipped it over the y-axis, you'd get the part of this graph on the left. And some of the trade functions are even. Most importantly, the cosine is even. And it, it seems like slightly eccentric of the textbook to start talking about even and odd functions before we really look at graphs. Um, the next section, what we'll do maybe spend all week next week looking at graphs. But for now, let's observe that the cosecant, the cosine, is an even function. I mean, if you took this, like this sort of hump here, and you reflected it over the x-axis, you would get this hump here over the y-axis, sorry. And then because of that, the secant, which is one divided by the cosine, is also an even function. Like if you took this hump here and you reflected it over the y-axis, it would reflect to this hump here. And let's 
write that down. That the cosine and the secant are even. So they have y axis symmetry. And another way of saying that is that the cosine of negative x is the same as the cosine of positive x. Yeah, that's correct. And likewise, the secant. The secant of negative x equals the secant of positive x. No, we can see that for, okay, like that's that x b, x b two pi, here's negative two pi. You see it's one in both case. We look at the cosine, here's negative two pi. Here's positive two pi. It's again one in both case. So if my memory isn't failing me, um, of the four trig functions, these ones are even and only these ones. There's a slight uh, asymmetry there. The other trig functions are what's called odd. And the phrase used for odd is symmetric about the origin. And this symmetry is a little harder to describe, then imagine the y-axis is a mirror. But let's look at an example of an odd function, kind of the prototypical example, just like even functions are called even because they're even powers of x are even, odd powers of x are odd. And you can think of this, that's, you can think of this as kind of having two mirrors. Let's say that, see if I can make Desmos cooperate here. Let's look at the part of this curve that is above, that is in the first quadrant. And let's flip it around both the axes. If we flip it around the x-axis, we get this. And if we now take this and flip it around the y-axis, we get this. So you can think of both the x-axis and the y-axis as being mirrors. And in terms of um, function notation, this means that f of negative x 
is negative f of x. Let's take a look. So here are the remaining trig functions. Most important is the sine. The sine is symmetric around the origin. Like if you take this point and flip it around the x-axis, you get down here. And if you then flip it around the y-axis, you get over here. Not the cosine, the cosecant. The cosecant, again, is symmetric around the origin, like this point here gets reflected to that point there. The tangent of x looks like this. We'll talk about these graphs, as I say, in a lot more detail next week. But um, for example, this point up here, is reflected around the origin to this point down here. And the cotangent, let's see. Like this point here is reflected around the origin to that point. So again, a bit of asymmetry. You might think half of them would be even and half of them would be odd, but the sine and the cosecant and the tangent and the cotangent are all odd. And then that allows you to make statements like the sine of negative x is negative the sine of x. The cosecant of negative x negative the cosecant of x. I feel like I went in a kind of weird order here, but the tangent, you know, the sine and the tangent are the really important ones, but you've also got the cosecant and the cotangent. And I mean, of course, I always feel a little weird. I mean, I talk about applications and I mean, you're in this class to be a teacher. So the application that you actually need is that you can teach it to other people. Like it's a bit weird to talk about this is used this way in calculus or engineering or whatever. But, you know, here's a statement that in my 151, in my calculus class, we do occasionally use. Um, the cosecant and the cotangent are less important. That we occasionally use. Continuing our kind of meandering path through this section's material, alternate forms of the Pythagorean theorem. And again, these uh, 
these are things that show up in Calculus 2, so they do have applications outside of trigonometry. But truth be told, I don't actually have these committed to memory. I just rederive them when I need them. So the Pythagorean identity says that the sine squared plus the cosine squared equals one. The alternate forms of the Pythagorean identity are, take, are gotten by taking this equation and dividing both sides by either the sine squared or the cosine squared. Like what happens if we divide both sides of this equality by the sine squared. Well, on the left, if you have addition in the top, You can break it into two sums. And you see that one of the things we're adding together is just going to be one. The sine squared over the sine squared is one. This we're going to massage a little. Having a square over a square is the same as having a single fraction squared. So we can write this as the cosine over the sine squared. And here, so this is a cute little trick. We're going to do the exact same thing, and we can do the same thing because one equals one squared. So we can put that square there and rewrite this as a single square. So the cosine over the sine is the cotangent one divided by the sine is the cosecant. And what we have there is one of the, what the textbook, well, not just the textbook, what everybody calls one of the alternate forms of the Pythagorean identity. And we sadly, I started with the sign and I got kind of the less important one. I keep saying this, um, the cosecant and the cotangent are the two less important of the four trig functions. If instead of dividing by the sine, I'd divided by the cosine, and here, because we've already gone through one example, I'm going to to go 
a little quickly. We can once again break this apart. Wait, I'm um, just yeah, repeating. I was gonna say, we... Yeah, I'm just repeating the same thing I did. It was the cosine that I wanted. So there's the sine squared over the cosine squared. There's the cosine squared over the cosine squared. There's one over the cosine squared. And we can do the same simplifications this is the tangent squared. This is one. This is the secant squared. And the tangent and the secant are, I get, I would say, the third and the fourth most important trig functions. So this is the second most important Pythagorean identity. Um, this is a side note, I guess. The, the reason that we have this, I mean, the reason the secret's important, that's a calculus thing, can't talk about that. I mean, it's totally arbitrary that the tangent ended up being thought of as the important one. It's just when you do right triangle trigonometry, you've got the opposite side and you have the adjacent side and you need an, a, a function that relates to them. And there are two functions that relate them. And because these functions relate the same sizes, the same sides, sort of one of them is going to be redundant. And we could have, we could have decided that we'll use the cotangent, but we didn't. Just hundreds of years ago, people decided that when they were doing right triangle trigonometry, they were going to use the tangent to relate the opposite and the adjacent side. And that largely arbitrary decision has reverberated through the centuries. So here's an important idea. And again, in this kind of correct Sure, textbook section. We'll, uh, it's not really directly related to what we were just talking about. But all of the trig functions are what we call periodic. Informally speaking, a periodic function. repeats itself. So here's the sign, and let's draw some vertical lines. Let me Let's see. I think maybe this stuff is going to be kind of distracting. So let's get rid of it. Let's draw x equals zero, x equals two pi, 
is of that. X equals four pi. X equals negative two pi. So if you look at the curve between any two of these lines, like you look at the curve between, I think this is negative two pi and zero, and you compare it to the curve between the next two lines, between zero and two pi, you see that this function, this sine function, is just the exact same pattern repeated over and over again. And that was the sine, but the cosine as well. Here's the cosine, here's that same picture repeated again. Here's that same picture repeated again. Here's that same picture repeated again. So the sine and the cosine are the same picture repeated over and over. And so are the other trig functions. Now here's maybe that maybe let's do negative pi over two positive pi over two um three pi over two Again, you see between these lines, you've got this curve, it crawls up this line, then jumps over and crawls up the other line. You see the exact same picture here. You see the exact same picture here. It's the same thing repeated over and over. And all of the trig functions, let me get the grades back. All of the trig functions have this property. I mean, here's the cotangent. You see it crawling down, crossing over, then going back down. It's the same shape repeated over and over. Secant has kind of a weird looking graph, but you see it goes up and down and then down and up. And that is then repeated up and down, down and up. Cosecant, same situation. That's not the cosecant. Cosecant, same situation. So for the moment, so let's just talk about the sine and the cosine. Um, when we had those graphs up, I got them down and now I need them up again. So here's the sine, for example, and I looked at zero and two pi and four pi. So you see this interval, I mean, because the graph is just repeating over and over again, the length of this interval which is two pi, is the amount of time it takes for the graph to start repeating. And although with the sign, it's traditional to think of starting at zero, let's say we start at negative pi over two, and we go to pi over two, 
then we go to three pi over two. Wait, that's not right. Let's try this again. In fact, let me just cheat and not try to figure those numbers out. Negative pi over two plus two pi, and then we'll go another two pi. Negative. Come on. There. So you see, once again, this is an interval of length 2 pi. And over this interval, the graph repeats. The picture between these two lines is the same as the picture between these two lines. And I mean, any interval of this length, let's do negative 0.3 then or 0.4, as the case may be, then negative 0.4 plus 2 pi, then plus another 2 pi. Again, the same picture that we see between these first two lines is just repeated over and over again. The period of a function of a periodic function is the time it takes the pattern to start repeating. And for the sign and the cosine, both. The period is two pi. We can state this in a slightly more formal way. by saying that the sine of theta plus two pi is the sine of theta. And the cosine of theta plus two pi is the cosine of theta. It takes two units for this graph to start repeating ourselves, So if we start at theta and we go to pi units, we wind up right back where we started. Likewise with the cosine. Okay, we'll call that here. This is the end of section 7.4. The homework is posted, and next week we'll take a look at these graphs in, in a lot more detail.